gran colisionador de hadrones, como se sabe, es un proyecto a, a gran escala que tiene varias subdivisiones. Él este, coordina este, el proyecto del CMS y, y a través de él dio grandes conclusiones sobre el, este, sobre el bosón de Higgs, que, que es un descubrimiento de, de alto impacto. Este, este, este proyecto este, tiene a más de 2.000 científicos en su, en su trabajo y, este, y tiene desde gran trascendencia. También se trabajó este experimento junto, junto al proyecto ATLAS, igual en, en CERN. Y, y bueno, todos estos fueron en base, o bueno, con el objetivo de, de encontrar pruebas contundentes sobre el bosón de Higgs. So, good afternoon, everybody. It's a, it's a true pleasure to be here. Uh, it was uh, too much of a temptation to come to Mexico when uh, uh, the CERN people called me up and said, uh, we'll have some lectures over there. And one of the things to do is go home to give a popular lecture. So I needed to say, absolutely. And uh, I, I'm really glad I did. So, for the talk today, I have uh, um, a presentation of what it is that we're trying to do at CERN, okay, and how the new, the modern day microscopes work. Now, in order to introduce the subject, you will allow me to go back to very, very basic things first, and then we look at the complicated experiments. So first, I want to talk to you a little bit about the so-called standard model of particle physics. Uh, it tries, what are we trying to do? We're trying to find out what everything is made of. That's issue number one. Then after that, these things that were made of, how do they interact with each other? How do they... The third question is, these things, how do they acquire mass? Why isn't everything around us at the mass of zero, which would be the most natural value? We will see that behind all of this, we believe that there is some kind of mechanism that whose manifestation in life is the existence of a boson, the Higgs boson. So if it's true, then what you have to do is design an experiment to find the Higgs boson, in other words, to, to see it, or well, we don't actually see it by eye. And then I'll take you through a very quick tour of what it meant to design such an experiment, because this was an odyssey that took 20 years to complete, and then I'll show you some of the results. At the end, we'll take a step back and we will say, so now that we found the Higgs boson, is this it? Is this the end of physics? Or is it actually perhaps the beginning of a whole new era in physics? And we'll leave with that question. So that's basically the outline of the talk. So let's talk a little bit about nature. Um, we all know that things are made of atoms. However, because we use our five senses to study nature, we are spoiled, and we think that the world as we see it is the, the way things really are. In reality, the world is very, very different if you use more advanced tools, a device here that detects light between 5,000 and 8,000, somewhere in the visible spectrum, and things that here from 3 kilohertz to 30 kilohertz, you realize how limited our senses are. So let's take the hardest possible tissue that we can think of on us, and that's what? It's actually enamel on our teeth. Now, if somebody tells you, what is everything made of, and what is there in between, you go to, let's say, a mundane tooth. So here is what you're going to see in front of you is a wisdom tooth. It belongs to a 22-year-old. And the enamel that you see here is actually the hardest tissue that there is on, uh, on a human body. And what we're doing is we're zooming in, and right here you see it's times four zoom, times five zoom, and this is actually one of the smoothest surfaces you can actually think of. In fact, it's very shiny. Now, as we keep on zooming on this thing, which is supposedly totally, totally smooth, by the time you get to magnifications around 30, you start seeing some little dark areas as if you're looking at the moon. We keep zooming in, and now, little by little, we recognize some small fissures and perhaps a hole here and there. By the time we get to magnifications of a bit more than 100, we recognize that the smooth surface, smooth it is not. It's actually 
this is beginning to look like a field that hasn't had water on it for quite some time. And as we approach it more and more and more, we're now beginning to see little valleys, almost some very deep canyons, okay? And it keeps going up. By the time we get to 1,000 to 2,000 times the magnification, by now what you really see is almost little mountains, okay? And we realize that suddenly what this is is a whole bunch of crystals. You see they have this shape, all of them pointing outwards. These are the so-called appetite crystals. Not appetite as in I'm hungry, appetite as in the material appetite, appetitis in, in Greek. And then what's even more is that as we keep on zooming, and by now we are at 20,000, we see that these crystals are actually, they seem to have sort of nothing in between. The nothing in between is actually water which doesn't show up here, okay? Because there's water everywhere. By the time you get to 50, 60,000, you start, you, you start zooming in on these crystals. Look at, look at the abyss right behind it. And little by little, we're now starting new structures that have very, very funny shapes. Keep zooming and zooming. By now we are at 300,000 and suddenly we see plaques. You see, sort of plates. Look at how different this is from the original picture. And you keep zooming, look at this. And then the other one over there, it looks like a cloud, but in fact it's just one layer on top of the other. And if we keep zooming, by the time we are at two million times, suddenly we see a field that seems to be very, very arranged in, in straight lines. And then as we keep on zooming on five million times, six million times, we see the trees, and they go like that. And these are basically the atoms of phosphorus and calcium of which a tooth is made of. This is what it's made of. Now think of that next time you brush your teeth in front of the mirror. It's actually very different. And in order to realize it, this we could not see. We couldn't see it because the shortest wavelength that we can detect is somewhere in the 4,000 nanometers, when in fact this thing is, uh, is an angstrom. Okay, so it's one-tenth of a billionth of a meter. So there's no way you can see it, which is why you need electron microscopes. Zooming back out, so this is what a tooth is made of. And in fact, it's not just teeth that are made of that. Everything is made of such things. Everything, the table, me, the projector, the air that we breathe in here, is made, as you know, of these elements. And what makes a difference between uh, oxygen and fluorium, fluoride, Oxygen is terrible for teeth. It makes them decay. Fluoride is extremely good, which is why you pay more money to buy a, a toothpaste that has fluoride. Is one more electron in the outer shell. The thing that gives you the huge variety of chemistry is simply the number of electrons that you have. You start with one, two, three, four, and you keep adding. So this one parameter is what determines it. The huge variation that you have around us. Now, so what do we believe? We we believe nowadays that these atoms, a ah, is the, uh, uh, the word that in Greek means it cannot be. So the atom, it cannot be cut. This atom is basically made out of the nucleus and the electrons that are running around it. That's good. Now what about forces? How does one particle act on another? In other words, we, go, we grow up and typically when we play football or anything else, acting with a force is equivalent to touching, right? Nobody has scored the goal without actually touching the ball. So then, is this all there is to it, or can you also act at a distance? Actually, we know that we can act at a distance in the other direction. If instead of zooming in, we were to zoom out, and what you see here is, uh, we are in Venice, Italy, and we're now zooming out. It's a good a, a idea to, every time that you see one of these circles, it's a factor of 10 distance. So now we just got to the Earth, and look around, there's nothing, nothing. At one second light, 375,000 kilometers, you just got the moon, and there's nothing. And what you see here, the, the, the circles that are coming in are basically the other planets, as we're zooming out and out and out. And here is our little sun, which is just a little tiny spot, and there's nothing and nothing, and nothing, and nothing. Actually, by the time you get to close to the neighboring stars, you need to spend five light years. And in between, 
There is nothing. This is the ultimate proof, of course, as you know, that in order to exert a force, you do not need to touch the other guy, right? You can exert a force from a distance. Gravity is, in fact, action at a distance. And to me, this was the biggest mystery when I first learned about gravity, is the fact that you have a mass here and you have a mass here, nothing in between, and they know about each other. I mean, talk about ghosts, huh? So, uh, and it is the same thing that uh, hits poor Isaac on the head. It's the same thing that makes the moon fall and it keeps falling on Earth, however, because it's also moving, it moves and falls and moves and falls and moves and falls, so it stays in this orbit. That's what we know of this picture. Bodies in the vacuum, they act on each other. Fast forward to electromagnetism. The advantage of electromagnetism is that we can see the modern uh, uh, image of what's in between, say, two masses or in between two charged particles. You can see the field that is set up. Here, all you need to do is take a magnet and throw some little pieces of iron, and sure enough, they will align themselves in the direction of the field. Unfortunately, we cannot do that with the, with the gravitational field because there's nothing, there's no dust that you can throw and you see which way the gravitational field goes because it's extremely weak. With this guy, it's strong enough that you can do it. So the idea is that in between, say, the North Pole and the South Pole, there is a field that actually permeates space, and it sort of has, this is, this is the line of the magnetic field. What's even more is that these fields, the electromagnetic fields, they can travel through matter and in the vacuum, which is why they can be used to find uh, the tooth that uh, come out wrong, and that's going to be very painful to fix, all the way to towers that give you TV, phones, and microwave ovens. These are all basically electromagnetic waves. Okay, so that's for electromagnetism. Let's zoom in some more. Let's restart, but this time around, imagine that I'm zooming in on my hand. Soon enough, we're gonna find molecules of DNA. You have this, uh, uh, this helix here, and here are the four letters. It's all written in four letters, that's what it takes. And we keep on zooming, and suddenly, by the time we are at 10 to the minus eight and nine meters, we see carbon, and then the three hydrogen all around it. Now we keep zooming, we are at a billionth of a meter, and what you see is bees. It's almost like a swarm of bees which are running around. These are basically the electrons inside the carbon atom. This is obviously a simulation. And you keep on zooming. At 10 to the minus 11, some, suddenly there are no more bees, and there's nothing, nothing, nothing. And then, if you're very careful, at the very far end, there is a little dot that is beginning to appear, a thousand times smaller than anything else, and that is basically the nucleus. So in fact, if we were to zoom in on those phosphorus atoms that we had before, this is what we would be seeing, the swarm of electrons, then empty space, and eventually we get to the protons and neutrons. And this is what things are made of. The most striking thing in this picture is not the fact, of course, that it's all made of little things. The most striking thing is how the nucleus, which is way down there and tiny, can control the electrons, which are at a thousand times the distance, thousand times the distance, way out there, in order to keep them moving just in the right amount in order to keep the atom be an atom. So here's a picture, okay, we have the atom, it's broken into a nucleus, a proton, a neutron, uh, it also has the electrons out there, and then we believe that this guy inside it has these quarks. A huge characteristic of these objects is that we think that today, and experimentally we have not found out otherwise, is that the smallest bits, the quarks and the electrons here, are point-like. If you remember from your geometry, a point has no size, absolutely no size at all. Okay? And therefore, it does bring an issue of if these things are point-like, shouldn't they automatically, we automatically also conclude that they should have mass zero. Why? Well, because why is this thing massive? Well, because it obviously consists of other things. And why is the inside massive? Because it consists of other things. You keep on going and going and going, cutting and cutting and cutting, like we just did, up until you get down to a size of zero. Well, that guy should have no mass. It's not made of anything else a priori, thinking simply. Then, in the 20th century, came two revolutions 
in physics. The first one is the theory of relativity, and then the other one is quantum mechanics. In fact, what quantum mechanics says is that actually things are discrete, even the ones that look totally continuous. And if you go in the woods in a, on a beautiful sunny day, you will see these uh, light rays that are coming down, and we learn that light is actually a wave. In fact, if I could zoom in on this thing and zoom and zoom and zoom into the light rays, what I, which we can do with experiments, but not visually like the rest of it, we would see that actually light itself consists of little balls, photons, that the electromagnetic wave, this wave that comes in from the sun, is itself, if you zoom in enough, it actually made of little discrete units. Unbelievable, but true. Why don't we realize it and we don't see one by one? Because the typical light bulb showers us with something like 10 to the 20 photons. That's billions of billions of photons, and therefore we don't realize the discreteness, just like we don't realize the discreteness in this thing that contains billions of billions of atoms. Marrying the theory of relativity with this idea that everything at the end of the day, even the wave itself, is a discrete issue, a discrete thing, brings a new picture of what a force is. Now, why is relativity important here? Because relativity says you cannot travel at infinite speed. So if I have a mass here and a mass here, if I do something to them, I'm not going to feel the difference up until the maximum speed of communication can come in. In the theory of relativity, that's the speed of light. It's an accident that it turns out to be the speed of light, but it's a universal speed. If today, right now, the sun just imploded, we would stay in orbit for a good eight minutes, up until we would realize that there is no more sun, and then the Earth, whoosh, would go out in a straight line. It would stop going around, because it takes eight minutes for the message from the sun to come to here. Guys, there's nobody pulling towards the center. So then with this, we have the modern day picture of what a force is. A force between two particles is actually the exchange of a particle. Think of two skaters, They're, they are on ice, totally frictionless, and one throws the ball to the other one. This is a matter particle, this is a force particle, so that's why they, they, they change their momentum, because this guy, you see where he is, by throwing the ball, his momentum goes backwards. And what is force? Force is the change of momentum per unit time. So that's what a force is. It's actually the exchange of particles. So in fact, the classical problem that you have to solve in order to get into the university, you have two charged balls, and then it's hanging from a needle. If it's the same charge, they are forming some angle. Uh, in other words, they're pushing each other out, and you have to compute this angle here. Uh, it is the, uh, it's died on me. Oh, no, it is. So you have to compute this angle. The modern day picture of this is that, in fact, the two charged balls are actually just sitting there and gunning each other down, boom, 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 with photons. That is what they're actually doing. They're continuously exchanging photons, which is why they're going up. Now, if you buy this picture, suddenly what you've done is that you filled up the vacuum. Because in a universe that's empty of everything else, however, it has two charges, okay, here they are, the two charges, what is actually happening is that these two charges are continuously throwing, say, photons at each other. However, in comes the final bit of quantum mechanics that says, you know what? You're not there to observe this photon as it travels along. So in fact, that photon can do lots of things. As it takes off and starts traveling, what it can do, it can actually go into a matter-antimatter pair, recombine, and continue going. And in fact, if you buy this argument, it can do lots of other things. It can do anything it wants between here and there because all of these quantum fluctuations are subject to what we call the uncertainty principle that protects it. We cannot see it unless we go in with gigantic energy. In fact, here is an electron that's traveling. What it can do, lots of things. It can emit a photon. It keep on going. It can absorb a photon. Here, these guys break into uh, an electron and positron pair. Then it can come back. It can emit one, absorb the other one, and keep going. You realize that this so-called free electron is anything but free. 
It's in fact continuously shipping photons, absorbing photons. Some of them recombine, some of them they don't recombine, they come back. This is a very tumultuous sea to be in. So in fact, the vacuum is actually not empty. For a poor guy who's going to travel through a vacuum, here is a computer animation of the vacuum. This is what you will actually see due to the quantum fluctuations. This is like a sea that you have to swim through. And this is basically the big idea behind what is called the brout Angler higgs mechanism that finally, unfortunately, people use only the word Higgs. There is a field, OK, that permeates all of space. It fills up the vacuum. Now, travels, particles travel. They swim through this thing. Now, if you swim through something, you feel resistance. Now, if you feel resistance, it means you have inertia. If you have inertia, that means you acquire mass. So suddenly, this mechanism can explain why a thing that has zero size, it is made out of nothing else. When it tries to travel through nothing, through the vacuum, it doesn't travel through nothing, nothing. It travels through the quantum vacuum. What it does is that it feels resistance, inertia. It acquires mass. So there is this field that gives mass to everything. And here is a picture of the standard model. You have the matter particles, the quarks, the leptons. You have the forces. These are the particles that get exchanged. And they're all swimming in this gray sea of Higgses. Now, so this is a field. Behind all of these pretty pictures, there's a lot of mathematics. I don't want to, to fool you because, you know, we're, we're explaining things so simply. This is just a summary of the interactions. If we just take one line here and we expand it, what you see, this thing here is just the terms for just the second line. In fact, it's half the terms, OK? So, now, th what I'm trying to say is that there's a real theory and mathematics behind this as well. Now, like any other field in quantum mechanics, there has to be a particle. There has to be something discrete that corresponds to it. The particle that corresponds to this field that's everywhere is what we call the Higgs boson. Now. Why can't we just observe the Higgs boson then by zooming in? If it's everywhere, if it's in the vacuum, why has it taken so many decades to find? The answer is because you need to supply enough energy so that if you make somebody who has a mass of m, you need to supply enough energy so you can pop him, you can make it. So you need to supply enough energy. And the point is that theory, it could predict everything except for the mass of this guy. In fact, it said that its mass could be as high as one tera electron volt. That's the title of the talk. And that's 10 to the 12 electron volts, or 1,000 times the mass of the proton. That's why we have not observed the Higgs boson, because it could be very massive. It turned out we found it at 125, not at 1,000, but it's still a lot of energy. So therefore, you need a means of putting a lot of energy into something in order to create the equivalent mass. So how do you go after the Higgs? And that's where the Large Hadron Collider at CERN comes in. Well, what you do is you build yourself something very large. And this is CERN. This is the airport in Geneva. This is Lake Geneva. And this is a ring that houses the Large Hadron Collider. It's a ring that's 27 kilometers long. OK? Now, this ring here holds two beams, one beam that goes that way and one beam that goes so they pass next to each other. But then at these select points, you change the angle a little bit. So they come in and bam, they hit each other. And it's at that point that there's enough energy to make stuff. If you were to look at it from above, this is a mountain that's uh, um, right next to CERN. The, uh, so here is, voila. So CERN is right here, and here is a large ring. In the back is the beautiful Mont Blanc. The ring is actually underground. And because the lake goes like this, it goes from 40 meters, which is uh, the depth at this point, to almost 100 meters where CMS is, because the mountain is on, is on the side towards us. It's full of magnets, OK? These big blue structures, which are gigantic, there's 1,200 of them, OK? They're superconducting magnets that each, what they store is 7 megajoules of energy, 
okay? Each one of them is 34 tons. And the cable, the superconducting cable that is needed in order to make these magnets is almost 8,000 kilometers of cable. The key parameter, of course, is once you have the radius, and since you know that when you turn the car, uh, uh, you cannot go faster than the maximum radius that you possibly can, you determine the maximum momentum that you can possibly have from simply multiplying the magnetic field, the radius, and point three, which corresponds to the speed of light. So that tells you the maximum energy that this beam can possibly have. You need superconducting magnets, and in order to do that, you need to keep them very cold at two degrees Kelvin, 1.9 degrees Kelvin. It is colder than outer space, empty space, which is actually at almost three degrees. It's the coldest thing in the universe, in fact. And the biggest problem is not to keep the, the beam going, because since the magnets are superconducting, it costs zero electricity to carry them. But it costs a tremendous amount of money to cool the magnets, and that's where you spend 40 megawatts of power. Now, if we were not using these super magnets, the circumference of the LHC would be 100 kilometers, and the energy that would be needed would be one gigawatt. So that's why we need the superconducting technology. Now, how does it work? You saw it from a bottle of hydrogen, that hydrogen goes into the little circle to go faster, to the next one to go faster, to the next one to go faster, and eventually it goes into the very large ring, two beams, one in each direction, and like we said, they come in, they get focused in the middle of the experiment. And what you have to do now, the next challenge is to build an experiment that can observe what happens when two protons smash each other head on at this very, very high energy. Here's a picture of it, in fact, it is not one proton and another proton running this way. What it is, is you can think of it as a train that has wagons. The wagons are all around. It's basically these guys over here. Uh, it takes a while for the mouse to wake up when I touch it. Sorry, it's, the pointer has gone on me. So here is a wagon, here is a wagon, here is a wagon. The blue going this way and the red going the other way. This is where they get focused. Each wagon is carrying 100 billion protons, 10 to the 11 protons, and 10 to the 11 protons. That's a lot of passengers. And then they get, they get focused at such a small distance as we will see that eventually these 100 billion from here and the 100 billion from here, one proton from one side and one proton from the other side will be close enough that they will actually smash each other and open up, put in enough energy into it. What does it make? Well, one of the things that quantum mechanics is that what it makes every time is a, is a subject of probabilities. So you throw the dice, it may make a photon, next time it make a W boson, next time it make a Higgs boson. How often does this happen? The kind of thing we're looking for, the Higgs events, is one in 10 trillion of all the interactions that go here. That is one heck of a selective process. The beam energy is tremendous. There's something like 2,800 wagons that carry these 100 billion protons each, and that corresponds to an energy which is 360 megajoules of stored energy. What does this correspond to? Let's bring in a physical image. It's like having two groups of elephants, imagine them, 120 elephants each, they're running at 40 kilometers an hour. Now that's a lot of energy in the beam, and the first thing you wanna make sure is you can control it because in the event of a power cut, you don't want to take these 120 elephants and go throw them at some house or something like that because you lost current. So therefore, you have to have a very intricate mechanism that controls the beam and goes and dumps the energy into the so-called beam dumps. That's challenge number one. Challenge number two is that you cannot have a big tube like this and another tube like that. They need to be focused over a very, very small distance. What's the focusing of these beams? Is it the head of a pin? Actually, sorry, a pin head is 0.3 millimeters. The proton beams have to be focused to a diameter which is 20 times less, 16 microns. So those elephants feel pretty squeezed at this point. And then what happens when they collide? It's a mess, that's what happens. The two protons break up and you have tracks all over the place. Now, what you see here is the cleanest event, yes. Because if I use a computer to show you only the tracks that have very, very high momenta, you get these green here, okay? 
And that is the example of a Higgs that decays into four muons, as we call it. What you need to do is build something that's going to register all of these guys and give you the ability to run various algorithms on it to realize that this is what it is in order to zoom in on that point. So that's a challenge. Actually, there's one more challenge. They come in and they hit each other, the two beams. However, they're gone. And then 25 nanoseconds later, 25 billionths of a second, the next wagon comes in and they hit each other. So in fact, this picture repeats itself every 25 billionths of a second, 40 million times a second you get that. And then one in 10 trillion is this. So that's the job that has to be carried out. Let me give you an example of how, how you deal with something like this and the challenges that there are. Here is the experiment. Here is a beam coming this way and the beam coming that way. These are the red ones. Now, you have clocks all over because this thing has 100 million channels. Now, these clocks are there because when these things will collide, they collide, they start going out at the speed of light, but they go out spherically. The detector is not spherical. It's basically cylindrical. So it means that the particles that come out of here will go that way, the others that go out of there. So these guys will get to the end before the others. So that means that there is a cosine theta. There is a, t there is a dependence on the angle on how long it will take you to get there. So every one of these guys will have to have its own synchronized clock. Then the second challenge is, if I give you 25 nanoseconds, and I tell you, you get 40 million times of these, and I want you to select for me the best 100. Let's go to 100 before we go to 1 in 10 trillion. You say, my god, I, there's just not enough time to decide, right? The photographer is taking the picture of the model and says, yeah, higher, lower, whatever, clack, 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 and taking pictures. Supposedly, the guy is so good that he can decide when to push the button. And every time he pushes the button, the camera is dead for a short time. So you better be clear on when you're going to push that button, because if the Higgs event occurs in the right, in the next picture, you lost it. So how do you do that? Well, in 25 billionths of a second, the only thing you can possibly do is store the information that comes out of one channel, store it somewhere in this pipeline. And what you do is you push it, then the next one comes in, and you push it, and you push it, and you push it. So you have a pipeline whereby each event, the data, is like a soldier. One. Then the next bunch crossing comes in, second, third, fourth. And the idea is that while these guys are stored here, you take them aside and you ship them to somebody who can decide who has more time. Now, if you have, say, 128 of these, then that gives you a few microseconds to make up your mind. The microsecond is more comfortable. So you have these processors that take the information, they think for a microsecond, and then they ship back the information all the way out here so that the data, as it's supposed to just fly out, fall off the cable, in comes a decision that says, save, save, and take out the data and, and eventually store it to disk. Let's do this in an anim animated way. So let me, uh, et voila. Here they come in. The particles start coming out, and you see that there is a wave while the other one is still going through the detector. So imagine now 100 million clocks that have to be synchronized that way. Information comes in, gets stored. Immediately it travels out. You have three microseconds. It gets to the processor. So at any point in time in the fiber, you have these four guys. And then this guy thinks about it and ships out the decision. Here is the decision just in time so that by the time the first one has come down, it's ready to save it. And this is for every single channel, 100 million times of them. In fact, it's interesting that even though this guy, the intelligence that says global trigger, has three microseconds to do the job, you waste a microsecond shipping the information up. You waste a microsecond shipping the information down because it's, uh, it's in the control room. And you only have one microsecond to make up your mind that, ah, this is a picture to take. Voila. Let's enjoy it once more. Data comes out, travels. In here, it gets processed in the regional trigger, goes to the big guy who says, take the decision. Out it comes. Meanwhile, they're getting pushed. And just in time for the rendezvous, it's never late, thankfully. There are many, many other challenges in making these detectors. Now, remember that each one of these lines is basically 25 nanoseconds. However, the signal that you get from any device is not 
is not shorter than that. In fact, the signal can be as long as 300 nanoseconds. So that means that the electronic signal that you read from one part of the detector spans more than one interaction. So eventually what you see is one interaction, another interaction, another, and you see the envelope of this thing. So you need to build super fast electronics that will clock at 25, clock, 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 and then eventually not read one event, but you have to read all of these in order to do the fit and realize that in the bunch crossing I was interested in, this was the energy that got deposited, say, in the calorimeter. They must be very, very granular because you saw the mess. If you're going to be able to have short, small enough hits to distinguish the tracks, you better have very small detector size. Very small detector sizes means a lot of channels, 100 million electronic channels. And then finally, all these detectors, they have to sustain this thing here. That's a lot of radiation. You don't want to put anybody in there. It's not even your worst enemy. Because in 10 years of LHC, the total energy that gets absorbed here is corresponds to 10 to the 17 neutrons per square centimeters. That's 10 to the 7 G. A G is one joule per kilogram. The mobile phone is a milliwatt per kilogram. So this thing is basically 1,000 times and 10 to the 7, so it's 10 billion times mobile phones. It's pretty horrible in there. So you need to make things that can sustain the radiation. So here's the answer. This is the experiment. Here's a beam line. Ah, here's a beam line. And then what you do is you build detector after detector surrounding it, and eventually all of this thing closes, and it's ready to register the interactions that are inside. The perspective is what we have built is basically a 3D, a three-dimensional digital camera, which has 100 megapixels. Now, beyond being 3D, the other incredible thing about it is that it can take 40 million pictures a second. Okay? And it takes pictures of things that happen very close to one-tenth of a billionth of a second after the Big Bang. Now, how much information do you bring out? If you were to bring out everything, that would correspond to something like 10,000 encyclopedia Britannicas. Now, to you, it no longer means anything because it's all electronic. But imagine having the equivalent of 10,000 Wikipedias per second. And then out of those, we make a selection of photographs. Yeah. The battery. OK. Am I using so much energy? Yeah? OK. And I'm inspired by the beam, you see. So, and then each one of these photos is basically a megabyte. So we need to bring out this information. How do you do it? You have a farm of processors, something like 5,000 CPUs after this decision, that look at all the pictures and decide which ones to take. What do we produce? 10 million gigabyte per year. This is the equivalent of 3 million DVDs in one year per experiment. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. The design, the development, the construction, the commissioning, the installation, and so on of these experiments is an opus that took 20 years. OK? 20 years is a long time. Let me give you an example from one just device. This is a production of the crystal calorimeter. Our calorimeter has 80,000 crystals. They get grown little by little via some process. We, they were produced in Russia, in Novosibirsk, and in China. So because these guys are experts in producing crystals. So here it is. And then this thing, you have to cut to a precision of 50 microns. And it has to become this thing. This thing is actually lead tungstate. It's a metal. This is lead. I know it's transparent, but it's lead, believe it or not. And then this thing, there's 80,000 of them that have to be characterized and then to be assembled. And then after that, you need to put all the electronics on top of it. And after you put all the electronics, you need to install it in the detector. This happened in July of 2007. And this was one of the detectors in the experiment. Let me show you another example, the, the forward calorimeter. We need inert material. We need a lot of brass. There was a lot of brass from World War II in the Ukraine from basically unused shells from the Russian military. Now, you take these guys and you melt them, and here you recover the brass. It was a very cheap solution, in fact. And eventually, here is a brass on our calorimeter at the end of the experiment. 
Here's another example of the type of, of, of recycling that we used. And then you have to dig down in order to build all of this 80 and 100 meters below ground. So you start from essentially one hole in the first building back in the year 2000. You also discover that at 40 meters there is an underground river that had to be sealed off because otherwise everything would get flooded as you can imagine. And then you build a cavern, this is all concrete, and in 2004 this was now ready and we could start lowering piece of the experiment. In fact, this is the central bit of the experiment that starts to go down. Every one of the photos you see, which is why people are quantized, is 15 minutes. Lowering this thing started at 6 a.m. and finished at 6 p.m. There's only one such crane in all of Europe, actually, that can lift. This thing is 2,500 tons. And the hull was designed in such a way so that by the time this piece, this is now 100 meters down, by the time it came down and put itself on the surface, the change, you didn't want the thing to sag because it's 2,500 tons, the design spoke of a tolerance of one centimeter. And it went down by 0.4 centimeters, by four millimeters. So that was the engineering for this thing. Actually, the detector is all sorts of cooling pipes, cables, and so on. There are 50,000 man hours that went into equipping it and 50,000 kilometers of cables and pipes that had to be put in in order to bring in the services. And then, little by little, you start assembling it. You put in detectors and you put in another one. And then here is the end cap that you bring in and you close it. And eventually, here it is closed in the barrel. And then you have the end piece that has to come in and you're ready now for LHC operation. In 2008, the magnets were closed, the final checks were made, and uh, the experiment started moving in. So the end cap that you see here starts moving in little by little by little. Here it is on the side. It goes in, it goes in, and goes in until it finally seals all together. And here it is closed. Totally closed the experiment. Here is one beam line, the other one is in the back, you can't see it, and it's waiting for collisions. And this is what we saw. You take, here is a simulation, but actually the data is real data. So you're going to see the two beams coming in. You're going into the middle of the detector, and you have a beam, and the beam, they come in, and they smash each other. This is one proton on one proton. These are, this is real data. These are the tracks we registered. The blue and the red are the energies that we measured. And from this picture, you try to understand what happened right there where they collided. This is a real event, despite the fact that it's a simulation of the detector. So it worked. And amazingly enough, it was taking the pictures of 40 million times a second, and so on and so on. So where is the Higgs? Well. Here's an example of a Higgs event. You recognize the tracks, and what you see here is basically you see these two greens, and there is no track that points to it. It's a dotted line. It's indicative of a photon and a photon. And in fact, the mass of these two is basically 125. Here's another example whereby you have a muon and a muon and the electron and an electron, and the four of them have a mass of 125. And the idea is that you cannot count on only one to prove that this is a Higgs because it could also be another process. The question is, are these events significant? Do they occur over and above the background in order to claim the discovery of a new boson? So what you do is you make the mass distribution of two photons. Here is a number of events. And you see that it falls. However, here, there is a little blip at 125. If I zoom in, this is what it looks like. This is if it goes to two photons. If it goes to two Zs, four leptons, like we saw before, you see the blue is what you would have expected. And right here, there's something more. And you go and read the mass. It's 125. It's the same mass as here. This is called a new particle that has a mass of 125. And it has just the right properties. It goes into two photons. It goes into four leptons, just like you would have expected the Higgs to do. And thus, on July 4th of 2012 is when the experiments announced that there is a new boson of mass 125 GV. It was a boson 
In other words, it was a force particle, like a force particle, because it decayed into bosons. It went into photons and Ws and Zs. These are bosons. So it's not a fermion like an electron or a quark. Now, is this the guy that gives mass to everybody? If it is, then if you plot the mass of everything that we know, the top quark, the Z boson, the W boson, and so on, and you plot here the strength, in other words, how often it gives you these particles, you get this beautiful straight line. It's a log plot with a block plot, but you see that the coupling, the strength with which it hits the matter particles is proportional to the mass. This particle can tell the difference in mass. Why? Because it is the particle of the field that gives the mass to these guys, which is why the strength of the coupling is proportional to the mass. The other thing, it's a spin zero. What does spin zero mean? You may know that electrons, for example, have a little spin of one half. It's, like, it's as if they have a little arrow on their head, and it can be the arrow up or arrow down. All the particles we know in nature, the fundamental particles, they carry a little pointer, all of them, except for the Higgs that has no such pointer. It spins zero. It carries the quantum numbers, the characteristics of the vacuum. Okay? It is the only particle that you can pop from the vacuum alone. Every other particle, you need to make them two at a time to conserve the various laws of nature. If you make an electron, you also need to make an anti-electron so that the total charge remains zero. If you make one photon, which has no charge, you also need to make another photon because the photon has angular momentum. So you cannot start from a universe which is empty and suddenly have angular momentum. You need to conserve angular momentum, so you need to make another photon that just balances so that the total angular momentum is zero. But for a Higgs, you can just pop it out of the vacuum alone with nothing else, because it has the quantum numbers of the vacuum. Because it spins zero, and because it couples to mass, it's a proof that this is a Higgs boson. So with this then, the question to ask, is this it? Have we completed the picture of the world? Have we found out what everything is made of? And have we found out what gives substance to everything via the Higgs boson? Do we now go home and look for a job? Because, of course, you know, there are no more questions to, ask, to answer. Let's look at history. With the discovery of the Higgs boson, the standard model is now complete. It was the last missing piece. Okay? And it's actually a remarkably accurate description of everything that we see in the experiments. This reminds us of previous times in history when we thought that the picture of, of nature was actually complete. For example, no lesser man than Lord Kelvin himself, of the infamous Kelvin, in 1990 said, there is nothing new to be discovered in physics now. All that remains is more and more precise measurement. This was in the year 1900. In f a short five years later, the theory of special relativity was invented. 16 years later, after 1900, we had the general theory of relativity, and the advent of quantum mechanics, the two revolutions that changed entirely the way we understand space, time, and the nature of nature, which is not deterministic, it is probabilistic. So thankfully, he was wrong. So if history is to repeat itself the way it usually does, well, where do we have hints that this may not be the end of the line? It's actually out there in the galaxies. Here is a galaxy, and thanks to basically the Hubble telescope, we're able to see all the way out to 13 and a half billion years. Now what you do with this galaxy is you look at it from the side, there's many of them, and you look at how fast it's turning. How fast it's turning, it's a very simple gravitational problem, okay? So you can say, how much matter is there in this galaxy? And you say, I see it. So the stronger the light, the more the mass. So I make a calculation and I say, ah, so therefore the speed, if I center myself on the galaxy and measure the speed with which it rotates, and I get that from, from spectroscopy, and I plot that speed, this is what I would expect if this is all the matter that there is. But you don't see this, you see this, this is what we measure. The difference, 
this huge rotational speed that somehow, if it goes so fast, the galaxy should be losing stars all over. It's going so fast that it should poof, they should be flying out, but they don't. They stay there. The only way that this can happen is if in here there's more mass than you see. So there's matter that's not visible. We call it dark, dark matter. And in fact, here comes the irony. After all of this, and the billions of Swiss francs, and the 20 years, and actually another seven years of running, and so on, and so on, and so on, we now have a measurement from these astronomical measurements that actually dark matter, here is the world that we all know about atoms. It basically, if you take the total energy content of the universe, what we know about is 4.6%, it's 5%. There's also dark matter, and then there's another thing that's called dark energy that takes the expansion of the universe and makes it go faster and faster and faster. It accelerates it. This is what we understand. Let me put it in perspective for you. If I take some jelly beans and I fill them up, this, the colored ones, is the stuff we understand. The black jelly beans is a 96%. And that's the stuff we don't understand. In fact, not only do we not understand it, we have no idea what it is. It's probably the biggest mystery as we speak. Is it a new type of matter? Is it new forces? Is it new dimensions into which one can propagate and so on? There are theories that can go into each and every one of these scenarios. The answer is we don't know. But there's even more reasons to believe that there's more physics. The first one the very existence of the Higgs itself. So think about it. We have a particle that is the existence of a field which is everywhere, okay? So whoever travels through it feels resistance. And the bigger the resistance, the bigger the mass. Aha. Uh -huh. So now let's imagine a molecule of water which is gonna swim through water. Now, it feels resistance, so it acquires mass. But it acquires mass, so it feels more resistance. So the Higgs boson, by the, being a molecule of water swimming in water, swimming in the other Higgses, it feels resistance proportional to mass. Mass, more resistance. Resistance, more mass. So it's an avalanche effect. So in fact, the mass of the Higgs boson, the guy who has the properties to give mass to everybody else, the answer is his mass or her mass has to be infinite. Because it feels resistance, gives mass, mass gives resistance, resistance gives mass, and boom, 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 you calculate this mathematically and you end up with infinite. Well, it's not an infinite mass. We observed it at 125, and it's a finite number. So somebody, somewhere, keeps the Higgs finite. What is it? We have no idea. But even more. So suppose that you do have all this vacuum energy now in the form of these Higgses and so on. Well, what would happen if you have this energy? And energy at the end of the day corresponds to some mass. Now, what would happen is that the entire universe would somehow be pulled in by that equivalent mass. It would be pulled in by something like, which is more than Google times the size of the universe. In fact, the universe itself, if all this vacuum energy is there, would be the size of a football. That may also explain why some people think that football is God, okay? So, of course, now we know better that the Higgs is stupidly called the God particle. It is the vacuum particle. It is a particle of the vacuum. God has nothing to do with it, okay? Now, let me give you an example. There's a whole theory out there which is called supersymmetry, and some of us are working hard at it and so on, and it says, you know what? You have, these are all the particles that we know about, matter particles, force particles, and here is the Higgs, in fact, imagine that there's a mirror symmetry, and every one of those has a corresponding particle this way. If you were to do this, it's a twin image, like particles and antiparticles, but with a new symmetry. It's almost like saying that you have two twins, which is they have identical qualities, except for one thing, because we have seen him, but we haven't seen him. Why? Because he's more massive, so you need more energy in order to produce him. Now, the trick is the following. These guys have exactly the opposite properties of these guys. So, in fact, as the Higgs travels through the sea, they actually create stability and they keep the Higgs finite. Could that be it? Well, how would we know? Here is 
the kind of thing we're looking for. Here is a picture of an event. We see here lots of particles, lots of particles, lots of particles. So if you add them all up, it seems that they're all going this way. There's nothing going in this direction. So either momentum is not conserved, which would be absurd, because momentum is always conserved, or somebody was produced and escaped the detector and left no trace where the blue is. What could that blue be? It could be a SUSY particle, a supersymmetric particle. It could be a dark matter particle. Because if the Higgs couples to mass, and dark matter has mass, then perhaps the Higgs is a portal to dark matter. The only way to know is to actually study it in great detail and look at all of its decays and so on and so on and so on. So to finish off, we have a quantum field theory, meaning the marriage of relativity and quantum mechanics that describes particles of matter and particles of force. It's not magic at a distance. It's the exchange of a particle that forces something. It is a very successful description of nature, but for decades it was missing the most basic element, which is how do you take these point particles and make them massive? They should be mass zero. Incidentally, the electron, if it were mass zero, it would not be kept on the atom. It would go to infinity, and there would be no atoms. There would, wouldn't be us. There wouldn't be the university autonoma, and so on, and so on, and so on. The LHD and its experiments are basically a 20-year odyssey. What I showed you here was not even a quick smell. The effort was gigantic. Over 10,000 people in, 100 and, sorry, in 240 institutions in 67 countries on Earth, including Mexico. The reward was we built amazing scientific instruments, and we found the Higgs boson at a mass of 125 times the mass of the proton. And it seems that it has all the right properties. However, now that we found it, we should not become too overconfident. Like every time you learn something, it opens up new questions. And in fact, the question now is, why is the Higgs finite? Why isn't it infinite? Because if you compute mathematically the properties of somebody who's going to give mass to everybody else, he himself must be infinite. And he's not infinite. Somebody keeps them finite. Even more, what's a dark matter? We understand 4% of the universe. So I'll tell you what, stay tuned, because there's going to be more news, I hope, soon. Voila. I'm happy. The physics are fantastic. <laughs> Thank you, Paris, the Paris for grateful lectures. Um, we have uh, time for two, two questions. Omar, <laughs> or Mona. <laughs> so who wants to break the ice and ask the first question, if there's one? OK. So, how many energy you will need to see supersymmetry? So the answer is we don't know, because mathematical theories, uh, they can compute the properties of things. So we can tell, for example, that it needs to be a, a mirror symmetry of the other particles. But we don't have information on the mass, just like with the Higgs. The theory predicted everything about the Higgs, except for what its mass should be. This must be pointing into some fundamental deficiency in our theories, because nobody has figured out a way of predicting these masses. So there must be some very deep mechanism that allows one to predict it. So you go to the highest possible energy, and you hope that it's enough. And then to the higher energy, and to the higher energy as technology improves. Other questions? Come on. Thank you. Uh, that was a very interesting presentation. So I have a particular question. 
but um, one of the countries that are participating in the development of this electronic because these are very sophisticated electronic, very fast. And uh, I am an electronics engineer. I am interested in uh, who is participating. And uh, what do we need to do in order to participate or add to this project in some way? Uh, I don't know. Um, yes. When you say we, you mean we as in Mexico, yes. the university. Yes. Yeah. Actually, you know, this is a gigantic project. And the development of these things was not the job of a single person, was not the job of a single institute, but in the case of the CMS electronics for just the calorimeter, okay, there was a group that was working at seven different universities, each one sharing different aspects of the design. In the case of the CMS tracker that has more electronics, there were people working on it from the US, three, four places, from the UK, Rutherford Lab, from Imperial College. Uh, there were people working in France, there were people working in Germany, there were people working in Taiwan, there were people working in Switzerland. So these are gigantic efforts, very, very large efforts. It's a little bit, it's a little bit like trying to build um, um, a, a plane. And you probably know that Airbus is actually getting built in many, many different places and eventually the pieces get carried over. It is such a large and complicated project that you need to distribute the responsibilities. You need to, to use the expertise everywhere. Now that has advantages because you're providing unprecedented challenges in electronics, in radiation hard materials, in cooling, in engineering, in mechanical engineering and so on to many countries, to many groups. And that basically challenges you to solve things that have not been solved before. So even though the Higgs will have no application in daily life for many, many, many decades to, have, to come, the stuff that we make in order to see the Higgs has applications because these things can be used elsewhere. So there is an indirect benefit Okay, not because of what you discovered, but because of the tool that you created in order to discover it. That's where the strength comes in. So I think the answer is it makes sense to participate because it's a great project for a high goal, but at the same time the intermediate stuff is a, just as rewarding. And you can use these electronics for many, many other things. The electronics we use in the trigger, they're used in telecoms. They use micro TCA crates and so on. I don't know if you know about TCA. Uh, prior to that, we were using fast buses. The FPGAs that we have on this electronics, we're now using the Xilinx 7. You know, these are things that contain billions of gates. And the firmware that has to be written is, is a very, very complicated code. So it involves everybody from physicists to engineers, technicians, everyone, the whole spectrum. Yeah. Come, come up front. I want to know if it's possible to obtain matter of the vacuum because all of these fluctuations of the vacuum, is it possible? Okay, now that's a very good question, excellent. However, if we were able to do that, then we would be violating the principle of conservation of energy. Because if out of zero energy, I'm able to produce something, I would violate that. So you tell me then, but then what's all the story about you can make one of it and so on and so on. Either you put energy into it and you make it, which is why, for example, you need the two proton beams. You pump the energy, you have that energy there, and now this thing can make a Higgs boson. And the thing I was trying to say is that you can make only one such guy, no need to make two or four. You can make three of them. You can make 17. You can make an odd number. But even more, you can make just one. However, you cannot just sit in the vacuum and wait for it to pop a Higgs boson and then say, ah, I just violated the principle of conservation of energy. Now, having said this, there are some people working in cosmology and so on who say that the entire universe was born out of a quantum fluctuation. 
that in this incredible mess, a sea of her, one of it, one of these bubbles just went poof, okay? And it started expanding via a mechanism that we don't understand, could be related to the Higgs, and it gave this. Now, unfortunately, right now, experimentally, we're far, far, far away from investigating this type of idea. But there are some hints in the imprint of the cosmic microwave background. But to come back to the original question, no, we cannot solve the energy problem of the world by just waiting for Higgses to appear. Because where would they find the energy from? And it takes 40 megawatts to make uh, one Higgs in, in that case. So that's not a good exchange. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, why a virtual particle? Uh down uh, buildings the the energy conservation okay that's an excellent question uh, why does a virtual particle for example uh, when we do this not violate the energy conservation principle so in this picture that I was showing earlier which is here apologize for going through this. That's the problem of having animations. It, take, it takes a while to go back. So here, why doesn't this guy violate energy? Okay, because the uncertainty principle has two sides to it. One says that when you measure position and momentum, you cannot have infinite precision. It's protected. In other words, if you want to go to very, very small distances, you're going to have a punishment in very, very large momentum uncertainty. If instead of space and momentum, you use time, the corresponding quantity for momentum is energy. So there's a second uncertainty principle between time and energy. So if you want to see that this thing actually does not conserve energy, then you need to measure it precisely enough to tell that this does not conserve energy. However, delta energy times delta T, the amount of time it's going to take you to do that, and the amount of energy that it violates it with is a constant that is related to Planck's constant. So if you were to measure it to confirm that this is the case, you would need to spend a time which is longer than the entire universe. So you cannot do it. It is protected by the uncertainty principle. It can exist for a very short amount of time, so short that you can never measure it to say that it violates it. So what quantum mechanics says, therefore, what you need to do is add up all of these possible things that can happen, because you can't possibly, you can't possibly tell which one happened. To tell which one happened, you need to go in. But you need to, if you go in, you need to pump in enough energy into the system that you changed it. It's no longer the same system. And you take the modulus of all that, you find the total probability. So that picture is protected by the uncertainty principle. By all means. I'm from Sonora. OK, hi, Sonora. We are full of ears. Can you hear me, excuse me? Now we can, yes. If you can speak loud, it would be good. I am terribly sorry, but actually your voice came out, it was, it was breaking up all the time, so we haven't heard what you said. Uh, the quality of the link is not very good. Can we have one more try, please? Speak slowly and loudly. I'm, I'm very sorry, but everybody here is shaking their heads horizontally, which it, presumably it means like me that uh, we can't hear you. I'm very sorry. I don't know if you, you guys here can do something to help or... Sorry? Ah, why don't you write it down in big block capital letters and put it on the screen? <laughs> Do you want to help and explain what the problem is, perhaps, in the native language? Uh, pueden escribir la pregunta. 
Pueden mandarla por escrito y acá la leemos. Sí, la van a mandar. Pues no sé cómo la van. Ah. Pero bueno, antes de que llegue la pregunta, por favor, más preguntas. La pregunta Puede es, ser en español si quieren. Ah, ya viene la, pregunta. la pregunta es: ¿a qué velocidad tocan De nuevo. ¿A qué velocidad chocan los protones eh, dentro del experimento? ¿Cuál es la velocidad de Protons in the collision. It's essentially the speed of light. It's 0.9999999997 times the velocity of light. So it's the speed of light. Tenemos, tenemos una, tenemos una segunda pregunta. A ver. Realizan muchos experimentos dentro de todo el proyecto. ¿Qué es el siguiente paso? ¿Cuál es el futuro para esta investigación? Next step, next, what about the future in LHC, the projects, the experiments, and... So, currently, what happens every year is that we run for something like eight months with the two beams and we take data, okay? Beam goes up, we take data for a day, Then beam goes down, we refill, again, take data for a day, come down, and so on. And then when we get to the end of the year, there is a shutdown of four months or so, during which we do maintenance, improvements, we fix broken channels. It's like any other engine. You need to do maintenance. Every three years, we shut down for a longer time. And during that time, we make a big upgrade to the accelerator in order to make the beams more intense, higher intensity beam. So right now there's an upgrade plan for the next 10 years, whereby in 10 years from now, the beam intensity will be 10 times higher. So we will be getting these events 10 times faster. So it will enable us to get 10 times more Higgs bosons per unit time. So that means that we will be able to study its properties with a larger number of events, therefore in more detail. So what's ahead of us right now, it's a program that has about 15 to 20 years of physics with upgrades every three years or so, and the big one in 10 years from now to give us a factor 10 in intensity. That's basically the plan. Pues un aplauso para el doctor Paris. Ya se, se lo van a llevar.